In Qadian, a muazzin calls the faithful to prayers. Five times a day in mosques around the world, this call is repeated. To the God who has created the heavens and the earth. To the God of Moses, the God of Jesus, the God of Krishna, and the God of Muhammad. God is great. God is great. There is none worthy of worship except him. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. God is great. And there is none worthy of worship except he. In the last hundred years, Islam Ahmadiyat has been one of the fastest growing communities in the world. A worldwide movement founded simply on faith and submission to the will of God. A community so simple, yet so highly organized to meet the demands and challenges of the ever-changing world. A community believing in absolute morality, in joining justice and fairness in every sphere of human interest. For many, much of the history of Ahmadiyyat has been veiled behind fear and misconceptions. As a result, its followers were subjected to extreme persecution and deprived of fundamental human rights. Yet, Ahmadiyyat's core teachings are interwoven with the teachings of the Quran and the Holy Prophet of Islam. It was Ahmadis who highlighted the flaws in the events of the crucifixion of Jesus, even before the realization by modern scholars. It was they who were first to translate the Quran in more than 50 languages, from serving humanity to projecting the message of peace. Continents across the world have been united under its banner. But all this began with the life of a single, ordinary man and the divine message he proclaimed. His name was Khulam Ahmed. Islam. Ahmadiyat, Islam, 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 Ahmadiyat. चले आते हैं यारों। The society in which man existed was at its lowest ebb, and the final religion of mankind chosen by God, Islam, was rapidly degenerating. The holy prophet of Islam, peace and blessing of Allah be on him, prophesied that in the latter days Muslims would suffer a terrible decline of standards. For if man is unable to control his desires, it is inevitable that the society would also suffer. The moral state of man was rapidly and dangerously declining. The Holy Prophet ﷺ mentioned by way of prophecy that uh, one thing, that in th that age the real faith will not be found among the Muslims. He mentioned that uh, they are scholars will not be really leading the people to guidance. Their places of worship will be very well attended, but without any guidance. And uh, the faith would go, he has mentioned in so many words, that to up to the Pleiades. And it will not be seen on the surface of the earth. P
फिर चले आते हैं when at a time of problem they will turn to the ulama and faiza hum iradatun wa khanazir so they will find them as uh, apes and swines they will not be uh, divines they will not be god fearing ulama it indicates that the scholars at that time they will be similarly similarly uh, you know their character would be simply a character of mockery they would not be representing the right faith they will be imitating uh, to be scholars and moreover their moral uh, character and conduct will not be uh, you know up to the mark or up to the standards of islam at all you know this is what you see in the mosques you see this very uh, mosque of other muslims other communities full of people but they have no understanding of the quran or they don't have uh, talk in their heart now when he came to these points he showed a positive side and the positive side was that when you see these things this will be the signs this will be the time that uh, that reform and that messi that mahdi would be raised and he would come to reform to make the quran the teaching of the quran understood more and properly and correctly history shows that when great mischief and evil takes over the world god the most gracious has always sent his prophets to dispel the darkness and save mankind from moral self destruction the followers of islam in spite of their degradation a time will come when god almighty will raise someone to help the people to right come to the right path and that will be the period of the revival of islam at every age whenever there was a um, downfall in any people god always sent a reformer so this i mean this is a continuous um, allah's uh, treatment to people of every age the salvation of mankind rested solely on divine intervention if ever there was a need for a prophet for spiritual guidance and uplift it was now ya man ahata al khalq bil alai it was not only islam that spoke of its own temporary decline the other great religions of the world also spoke of a similar fate for themselves they too were anxiously awaiting the advent of a promised reformer as predicted in their holy scriptures the jews expected that the messiah would rejuvenate judaism the christians claimed that the second advent of jesus would bring nigh kingdom of heaven the muslims believed that the messiah and mahdi would join forces to bring about the final renaissance of islam and its victory over all other religions the hindus awaited the coming of god in the form of krishna and the buddhists were awaiting the reincarnation of buddha but this raises the question how could god send different reformers at the same time each calling to the same god in his own way how could god invite mankind to divergent paths and conflicting ideologies all uh, faiths including uh, islam and christianity claim that uh, a prophet will come in the latter days whether he's messiah or mahdi or and the krishna but logically speaking if god sent all these people in these latter days there be so much conflict will they bring the same law will they bring the same message but if their messages aren't the same that will create disorder in the earth so he can only bring one message whenever the prophecy about the advent of someone is mentioned in in religious terms it always means somebody else coming in place of somebody else in case of uh, jesus christ peace be upon him let's see when he said that uh, uh, elijah would come it was mentioned there and he referred to john the baptist that he is the one who has fulfilled that prophecy so the coming of one was prophesied another person came in the likeness of the same person and this is where people go wrong when they want a literal uh, fulfillment of the prophecies which is which doesn't happen it didn't happen in the past and it will not happen today 
This is where the people go wrong. The only solution for this is that uh, all those people who are uh, uh, expected to, to appear at that time, uh, we can say that all those people should be one person in different, uh, with the different titles in different uh, uh, aspects of his personality, could fulfill all those prophecies in his person. Marhaba dar amane qadiya An event would take place over a hundred years ago in Qadiyan, a tiny hamlet in India, which would answer this perplexing question and bear witness to the manifestation of God's mercy on mankind. It was an event which was destined to change the course of history forever. There appeared a religious leader, specifically commissioned by God to lead mankind as the promised reformer, the Messiah of the latter days. His name was Hadrat Mirza Hulam Ahmad. It was revealed to him that he would be a soldier from God, wearing the garments of different prophets, combining in his own person the qualities and the role and spiritual powers of all the great reformers whose advent had been previously promised. He proclaimed that God had chosen Islam for the universal and final manifestation of his unity. Thus, in accordance with God's divine command, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad claimed to be that reformer who was destined to be raised in Islam. He would not bring anything new, and he would be in complete subordination to the Prophet Muhammad, the last law-bearing Prophet. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Hazrat Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. His teaching is final. This is the meaning of Khatam al Nabiyin. It means, in future, no new teaching can come because as we are discussing that his teaching is perfect so nothing can be added to the perfection so he is khatam means his teaching is perfect in future nobody can come with anything new no one can come with any new claim <laughs> Hadrat Ahmad was a champion for the cause of Islam, bringing hope and strength to all Muslims by defending Islam against its enemies. From early childhood, he was extremely given to worship of God and meditations and prayers, and he was always doing some service to the cause of Islam. He loved the Holy Prophet ﷺ very much, and he spent all his time trying to defend Islam and defend the Holy Prophet ﷺ because at that time there were a lot of people who were trying to say uh, wrong things about Islam and, and to put wrong allegations about the teachings of Islam and about the Holy Prophet ﷺ. He was known as a man that was very close to, to God Almighty. He spent all this time in isolation. Uh, he preferred to study the Quran, he preferred to study the Hadiths, the books of, uh, those books were written by the classical scholars by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was known to be very meek, very humble, very pious, very kind, very caring. I mean, this, this was his nature. He was called the champion of Islam at that time, and this was witnessed by the people around him and was admitted by a lot of people, including the people who did not believe in him in, in later on, when he claimed to be the promised Messiah. Those people who did not believe in him, they were the very same people who earlier said that he's the champion of Islam, and he's the defender of Islam, and he's the only one who has raised a voice to defend all those uh, wrong allegations which were uh, being said by followers of different religions. He was a great spiritual son of the Holy Prophet who would lead the foundation for reformation and renaissance of Muslims. In essence, his character was immersed in the love of the Holy Quran and of his master, the Holy Prophet of Islam. He appeared in the 14th century 
of uh, Islam, according also to the prophecies of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who has uh, told us that he will appear at the, the beginning of the 14th century. And uh, this also has a symbolic uh, meaning because it is, he is like a reflection of the light of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we say that the source of light was the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came as a reflection to reflect this light and the full light was uh, uh, was shown in the beginning of the 14th century uh, so that it will be like a symbolic uh, uh, appearance like the moon when it comes when it, when when the full moon uh, appears in the sky uh, at the on the 14th night this is exactly what happened that he has come on the 14th century when the when the muslims were in in the in need of this guidance he arrived and he has fulfilled the prophecies and he has come in the time and in the in the description which was there all the time Hadrat Ahmad challenged the Christian beliefs about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ God revealed to him that Jesus did not die on the cross but rather he had survived the crucifixion and completed his divine mission of preaching to the lost tribes of the house of Israel. On the authority of the Holy Quran, the promised Messiah, the founder of the community, he made this point very clear, which was a big news for people. Many people thought it very difficult to believe, but once they pondered over those verses of the Holy Quran, which the founder of the community presented before them, it was quite clear for them that first thing for, uh, is that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not actually die on the cross. He proved it from so many verses of the Holy Quran. And he made it very clear for everybody that he was no doubt put on the cross, as the history tells us. He was nailed to the cross. He stayed there for a couple of hours or more. But he actually did not die on the cross. Biblical scripture is very clear he did not die. I mean, it's clearly written in, in the New Testament, if you follow it carefully, of the Gospels of Matthew and, and, and other Gospels, he survived that cross. As a former Christian, I believe that God had put his son on the cross. And I used to think, what type of father would kill his son just for the sake of someone else's sins? And when I read the, the book of the Promised Messiah Islam, the, you know, I felt such an overwhelming sense of relief that uh, he didn't die on that cross. And uh, he produced biblical evidence to say that he didn't die on the cross, not his own evidence. You know, he was taken down from the cross after only three hours on the cross. Normally, from when you research on crucifixion, a very fit young man like Jesus was at the time, I think he was stay on the cross for a number of days. But because that day was the Sabbath day, he had to be taken down the cross before the uh, uh, sunset. Medically speaking, uh, he wouldn't have uh, died on the cross in three to four hours. Because in the olden days, they used to put, on, put the, uh, um, these uh, criminals on the cross for um, even a few days, at least 24 to 48 hours. Secondly, they used to break their bones. You know, the two um, robbers on his side, their bones were broken. But Jesus Christ's bones were not broken. When the soldier, you know, pierced his side with his spear, out gushed the water, the blood, which normally you don't get off a, a dead body. It is medically proven that if a person is dead, his blood clots and it doesn't uh, remain liquid or fluid. So if he was dead, the blood and water wouldn't have come out. He was taken down, his legs weren't broken like his other two people um, who were crucified with him. And he was taken into a cave. He was administered to by um, a doctor, Nicodemus. He was a physician who anointed his wounds, the whip marks on his back and uh, the crucifixion uh, wounds, and the wounds on his head from the thorns. Jesus, in fact, was a prophet of God who died like all other prophets. We see that the Quran is pointing to the, to the fact that uh, Hadrat uh, Isa uh, has actually died.
like any other human being. And uh, these uh, verses are very clear for the person who can see them. For example, there are uh, a few verses, like for example, in Surah Maryam, when Hadrat Isa himself is, is talking and saying, here he is saying وَيَوْمَ أَمُوت أَمُوت means I, when I die there is another uh, verse also in the Holy Quran which is uh, like a, a discussion or a, a, a question answer uh, dialogue between God and, and Jesus alayhi salam and in it uh, the, uh, Allah is asking him about his people about, uh, about his people after him and uh, Jesus is answering God and telling him that I did not, I, I was only witnessing what they were doing when I was alive between them. But uh, when I died, I did not know anything about it. And he's, he's, he's using the, the expression, فَلَمَّا تَوَفَّيْتَنِي فَلَمَّا تَوَفَّيْتَنِي means when you caused me to die. So he will die like any other prophet. As such, Hadrat Mirzo Hulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, announced that through his own advent, he had fulfilled the prophecy of the second coming of Jesus. He also claimed that in his person he fulfilled the prophecy of the second coming of Jesus, explaining Jesus was a prophet of God who died like all other prophets. He was informed by Allah that Masih ibn Maryam, Rasulullah fought ho chuka hai. Uske rang mein rangin ho kar tu aya hai. That is uh, Messiah, the son of Mary, passed away. You came with his quality. Here was a normal, humble man of God who was vouchsafed by God Almighty that he was that Messiah, that Mahdi, and that he was to go and proclaim this, that he was that very person which the prophecies of how the Prophet Muhammad talked about, the prophecies even of uh, the prophecies in, in New Testament scripture as well mentions this. This was an astonishing claim indeed, and what made it even more profound was that his solitary voice, raised from a small and unknown village, insignificant as it seemed to the world at large, was even heeded at all. Some responded to Ahmad's call with complete faith and devotion. However, as the followers of the community grew, so too did the opposition against him. To the non-believers, the divine reckoning Ahmad evoked was an outrage. His dismantling of their false customs and heritage was deeply infuriating. When the message of Ahmadiyyat, it uh, started spreading far and wide, naturally it did not go without any reaction. And people and also the governments in various countries, they reacted to this one. Particularly if we talk about Pakistan, there was a very strong opposition and uh, hundreds of people, they actually had to lay down their lives just for the cause of this uh, great message that they are presenting. If you study the history of prophets, um, I mean, example I will give you again is the same time that Jesus uh, in the synagogue proclaimed that he was the Messiah, he was the fulfillment. The reaction was a very negative and violent reaction. This was the actual reaction to the point where he was thrown out of his city. Exactly the same happened with the Prophet When he, remember, he was well known by this time now, but this time he had become known as a champion of Islam. People respected him highly from all around the Islamic world. And even he had some respect from the Christian world as well, because he was a man that was standing up to their claims. When he made the claim, the reaction was of anger, the reaction was of uh, disbelief, the reaction was, it's impossible. And it became violent even. I mean, many of the mullahs, if you want to call them mullahs, or the, the clerics at that time, their followers just became angry and started hurling abuse that you are a liar, a deceiver, a heretic, a kufr, whatever you want the words to use. This was the reaction was, and it was very severe. And 
And the reason for that reaction was that uh, this was something which in a way shook the whole the base of understanding for them. Because if people have been believing in a certain idea for generation after generation, and suddenly they are told that this is not, they were waiting for some other type of Messiah to come, some other type of Imam Mahdi to come. But when suddenly the founder of the community said, no, Jesus has died a natural death. They were believing that he is alive in heaven and he's going to come down. So they were just waiting for such a man to come down and touch down on earth from heaven. Because of this threat to the traditions of their forefathers, many raised a storm of hostility, the like of which has seldom been witnessed in the history of mankind. The, the, the first reaction was uh, rejection. And this is normal because we know from the history that every single prophet had the same experience. Whenever a true prophet comes to the world and claims to be from God and claims to be bringing uh, uh, any message from God, the first reaction is rejection. A few people uh, accept this messenger, but the, the majority reject him. But there is nothing to surprise about that because persecution is always the ways of those who come from God. Look at the history of religion. Is there any prophet who has not been persecuted? Is there any prophet who has not been opposed? The Holy Quran bears testimony to the fact that any prophet coming from God Almighty has to face the opposition and persecution. And the history of all the prophets is in front of us. The same thing happened to the promised Messiah the founder of the community. When he claimed, something very strange happened in a way that those people who used to admire him before, him before that, those who were his friends and supporters, and even those people who were looking towards him as a man who is going to help them in this difficult time, these people turned into foes. It was, uh, in reality, goes in line with the prophecy of Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when Prophet Messiah comes, then the ulama of the time will be most hostile to him. Persecution is, is part of um, any truthful community. I mean, again, if you study the history of religion, all truthful prophets of God, they were persecuted. Their followers were persecuted to the point where their homes were destroyed. His followers were subjected to extreme persecution. They were deprived of religious freedom and fundamental human rights. In the month of Ramadan, um, Imam of our mosque, who himself accepted Ahmadid after thorough research, who was very convinced about uh, the truth of Ahmadiyyat. So mullahs of the locality, they came uh, and they tried to create pressure on him to leave Ahmadiyyat. He said, if you have got any logic on the basis of the Quran and Hadith, bring it and talk to me. If you can uh, convince me, then um, I'm always ready to go back because I am, uh, after all, looking for truth. So I saw truth here. That's why I accepted it. According to the prophecy of the founder of Islam, Messiah and Mahdi came, so I accepted him. If on the basis of the Quran and Hadith you, you can prove this wrong, I'm always ready to uh, say this by. But uh, they did not have any logic. They were not ready to go into the Quran or the sayings of Holy Prophet They had mullah with them, they had madrasas with them, and they came with hockey sticks. So they just hit him and killed him on the spot. Even laws were enacted in some countries to render them liable to severe punishment and persecution for the mere act of professing and practicing their faith. I've been to Pakistan, I've lived in Pakistan for a while, and I've seen and I, I felt that intensity 
of uh, not being able to proclaim my faith as being an Ahmadi Muslim, knowing that I can't go around saying Asalaamu Alaikum. And, you know, this is part of the, you know, being persecuted. Uh, it's wrong. I don't think in modern times we should be persecuted like this, but it's there. It is part and parcel of, of uh, the true claimant. But the sign of the truth of that person is that uh, despite of this rejection and despite of the persecution and despite of the, the people trying their best to stop the spread of his message, any true prophet has the, the help of God and God himself uh, makes sure that his message will be spread in the world. Yet, all this overwhelming opposition utterly failed to arrest the progress of Ahmadiyyat, which is marching forward even faster today than ever before. Every opposition, every hostility left the community bigger in size and greater in spirit and spirituality. In spite of all the, 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 the efforts to stop this, the spread of his message, we find that even today this, the message is continuing to spread. His message has reached the, the four corners of the earth as prophesied as the revelation he has received himself. We find that uh, his uh, message is flourishing more when persecution gets worse. The more persecution, the more uh, his, his message spreads and the more uh, we find that the help of Allah is coming to his, uh, to his followers. All the efforts of hostile fanatics, be they individuals, groups or governments, have totally failed in their aim of wiping Ahmadiyyat from the face of the earth. Instead, God stood by his servant, Hadrat Mirza Hulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, and fulfilled all his promises, and, as prophesied in 1898, caused his message to reach the corners of the earth. Today, Ahmadiyyat stands established in over 182 countries, and the pace of its growth is destined to engulf the entire world with its message of love for all, hatred for none. That is to show that the message was not at all hampered. Difficulties are always there, and difficult times were also there, not only during his lifetime, but also after the, uh, his demise during the period of caliphate. Always there are trials, oppositions, so many slogans, so many resolutions, so many ordinances, all these things are there. Difficult times are definitely was there and they will are there and they will be there. But that means that, uh, that doesn't mean that the message is going to be stopped ever. <laughs> In accordance with guidance from God Almighty, Hadrat Mirza Hulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, created the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to rejuvenate Islam and re-establish the unity of God in the world. His divine mission was to present Islam in its pristine purity, restoring the same teachings that were taught to us by the Prophet Muhammad. First thing, he has not created anything new. By, the, uh, by that he meant that uh, I am not introducing or presenting anything totally new because his very mission was simply the mission of revival of Islam, to reintroduce the true message of Islam. He would offer a clear presentation of Islamic wisdom and philosophy, morals and spirituality as derived from the Holy Quran and the practice of the Holy Prophet. The same Islam which advocates peace and love tolerance and understanding among followers of various faiths. He would form brotherhood, not through bloodshed and coercion, but through devout faith and absolute submission to the will of God. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community claims to be the, the one who is following the true teachings of Islam. 
Of course, all the other sects will claim the same thing. Anybody in any sect of Islam will say that we are the true Muslims. It's very interesting to note that uh, the Holy Prophet of Islam, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, he was asked uh, a very pertinent question. When he made the prophecy that uh, Jewish people, the Christian people, they were divided, so the Muslims are also going to be divided. And he mentioned that uh, they will be divided into 73 sects. And 72 of them will be in the wrong. And only one will be on the right path. And he mentioned that uh, the, other, mm, the one on the right path would be the people going to paradise. All of them will be hell going, except one sect. So companions asked him, put this question, that, O Prophet of Allah, how shall we recognize the Naji or the paradise-bound sects or successful sects among your followers? That if you want to find out who are the members of that organized community and who are those people, then I tell you one criterion, and that is that they would be following the, my path and the path of my followers. That is to say that they will be doing on the positive side the same things which I do and which my followers have been doing. The situation, the environment, the condition in which you see me and my followers today, they will be on the same condition, the same environment, the same situation they face. Now call to your mind what was the situation Hazrat Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, was facing. The companions of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they were not allowed to say kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There is none worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This is the fundamental declaration of faith in Islam. So these people were persecuted for that, tortured for that purpose. And a full history is there to find out uh, what sort of treatment was given to them. The Muslims were called names. They were not allowed to claim to be Muslims. They were given a different name, Sabi. They were not allowed to call their mosques to be mosques. They were not allowed to say Azan, call for prayers. Their houses were burnt. Exactly, exactly same situation is faced by the community today, everywhere. Ahmadis are not allowed to call themselves to be Muslims. If any Ahmadi claim to be Muslim, then they send him to, to jail. They are not allowed to name their worshipping place to a mosque. If anybody does that, then he is punished. They are not allowed to say kalima, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And Ahmadi are not allowed to say assalamu alaikum. Their houses are burned, their business are destroyed. The way the Holy Prophet and his companions were persecuted, the same history is being repeated. So much so that one uh, prominent leader in Pakistan, once he admitted in a court statement, that nowadays we are doing to the Ahmadiyya community and its followers the same treatment as the non-believers used to do to the Holy Prophet and his followers. So they have come out with the truth. The cat is out of the bag, as they say. All 72 sects unanimously declared only one community should be non-Muslim. Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu said that 72 will be hell-bound. Only one, only one community will remain in one side. That will be paradise-bound. <laughs> the continuity and growth of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been blessed by the revival of the institutional Khilafat in Islam. The Khalifa is the spiritual head of the worldwide community, and his every command is obeyed by his followers. Thus, Ahmadi Muslims from all walks of life 
stand united behind one leader. The institution of Khilafat, which can be described as the system of spiritual leadership in Islam, is uh, one of the very important things to be understood. After the demise of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, he made a prophecy that there will be a system of caliphate after him, which will continue up to uh, nearly 30 years. And this is exactly what happened. And then he mentioned that there is another stage in the period of latter days when this institution will be restarted again, re-established again. And that would naturally be after the demise of the one who was promised to come, the reformer of the age, the promised Messiah and Imam Hadi, when he will pass away, after his demise, again, once again, this system of Khilafat will be established. There was no prophethood which was not followed by a series of successes. Because of this, Ahmadi Muslims have become the most highly organized, educated and disciplined Muslim community. Allah Wahi al Jamaat. That remember it, that one group is going to be that which is really and truly a Jamaat, a well organized community. And by that he was referring, obviously, to that verse of the Holy Quran in Surah Noor, where Allah Almighty has mentioned that the righteous people will be blessed with the institution of Khilafat. <laughs> The blessing of Khilafat is something very important for the continuation of uh, true Islam in the world because uh, anything without a head cannot continue, cannot survive. And Khilafat is the head of, of the body of Islam. So without Khilafat, Islam cannot survive. It's a blessing. You look at the rest of the Muslim world. This is a fact, and, and no one can deny this. Anyone who looks at this, we are the only community which is unified. We're unified under one spiritual leader, which is known as Khalifa al Masih. This is a great miracle, and it is a miracle, because all these people around the world, at one moment, when the Khalif, when the Khalifa mentions anything, when Khalifa al Masih says anything, they listen with attentiveness and they obey him. You will not find that anywhere else in the world. You will not find it in any other Muslim community. <laughs> And we can see that by the grace of Allah, our Ahmadiyya Muslim community is the only one from all the Muslim sects today which is having this institution of Khilafat and under the banner of that Khilafat all the community is progressing. God's mercy and blessings on the community are evident in their achievements in the last hundred years. In the word insan, some of the commentators write that uh, it, this word is actually unsan. Unsan means two love or two loves. One love for creator, another love for creation. The religion has got two aspects. Love for the creator and the love for his creation. I'll give you one example. I mean, I remember once in Dublin, in Ireland, we had this banner up which says, Love for all hatred for none. And a Jewish, Orthodox Jewish man came to me, read the banner, and said, that, Do you really believe in this banner? And I said, Yes. He said, But I am Jewish and you are a Muslim. So how can you love me? So I told him that we are from that community from those people who have no hatred for anyone, which is teaching of Quran. The community has well-established schools open to all in many countries around the world, from Sierra Leone in Africa to the Fiji Islands in the South Pacific. In field of service to the humanity also, 
Ahmadiyya Muslim community is unparalleled. Globally, everywhere, since um, another sign of the community being the true community is a service to humanity. Islam, the teachings of Islam is that we should serve our fellow human beings in, in the times of need. As a community, this is what we have been doing. It has been always that way. For decades, the community has opened up many hospitals and medical clinics that offer free medical care to those in need. We have built hospitals, we have built clinics, we have opened schools, we have opened colleges in Africa, all over the world we have been doing something. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, a part of, it's a part of our duty. It's, it, it should be second nature to us. It's not something that we should have to think about. In times of natural disasters, the community has always responded swiftly to deliver aid to victims. From the Great Kobe earthquake in 1995 to more recent times and the devastating earthquake in northern Pakistan. In just in recent times, times of um, tsunami, the times of uh, Kashmir, which I was there myself. Um, I mean, Kashmir was a remarkable thing to see and observe because here was a country which persecutes us. Here's a country that persecutes Ahmadis, but the Ahmadis responded with such love and tenderness and care, which was unbelievable. It is a well-known fact that even during the worst humanitarian conflicts, the community has always been at the front line of deploying aid. I mean, as far as Humanity First is concerned, I mean, the whole, in the, the whole reason it was initiated was to serve humanity. That's why it's called Humanity First. Humanity First as an organization is very unique. Um, I think it is at least because uh, everything and anything that it collects is for the sake of suffering of other human beings. Among the millions of Ahmadi Muslims are some who have had profound influence on world events and have been recognized by the international community for their outstanding services to mankind. We had an opportunity the other day to discuss this question with a prominent Asian jurist, Mohammed Sabula Khan of Pakistan, who is the president of this 17th session. Sir Mohammed Zafrula Khan was the first foreign minister of Pakistan, as well as at one time president of the General Assembly of the United Nations and President and Judge of the International Court of Justice at The Hague. He was chosen by Qaidi Azam to represent Muslim League and Muslims uh, in the tribunal that had been set up for partition of the Punjab. Now, Qaidi Azam was so pleased with this that although he held no office, he was asked him to lead the Pakistan delegation to the United Nations. He put the map of Pakistan on the world mapless. That was what the statesman of Calcutta said. Another such Ahmadi Muslim was Professor Dr. Abdus Salam. He was at the forefront of research in his field and won the Nobel laureate in physics in 1979. He founded the world-famous International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy, which has since been named after him. Both Dr. Abdus Salam and Sir Zafrullah Khan were devout Ahmadi Muslims and highly respected scholars of Islam. <laughs> Many revelations were vouchsafed onto the promised Messiah. One of them being, I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. This revelation, referring to the revival of Islam in the world by the promised Messiah, has been literally fulfilled by the global progress of the Ahmadiyya community. But in 1994, the fulfillment of this revelation took an extra dimension with the establishment of Muslim Television Ahmadiyya International.
This is the community's own satellite television station, and its objective is to spread the unity of God throughout the world. We have got the international MTA, Muslim Television Network, which is our voice and which spreads the message and people can easily find out the information about that. It is a unique station in many respects. It is run almost entirely by volunteers and it is funded by the members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Through MTA, the Khalifa is able to address the entire world. In this way, MTA becomes a demonstration of Islamic equality. It gives the Khalifa a chance to advise all Muslims at the same time on urgent matters that face them. Islam Ahmadiyyat is the religion which does away with all discrimination between man and man and demolishes all barriers of race, color and creed which divide mankind today. Islam, Ahmadiyyat is Islam. It has the unity bringing the whole of mankind together. It has the same self and same message. It has equality. Islam Ahmadiyyat liberates man from the bondage of sin and strengthens his ties with his creator. You know, in Christianity, you, you're born in sin. So what chance have you got to improve yourself? You're already a sinner. Islam is such a beautiful religion. It explains all the things we need to know and for future events. It is a religion so simple yet so highly organized to meet the demands and challenges of the ever-changing world. This is the path which actually invites the whole mankind to their salvation. And this message is based on divine call. The promised Messiah was called upon to start this community, following the noble example of the Holy Prophet and following in his footsteps. He has founded this community so that it will be like the seed and the, the new plant, which is uh, symbolizing the true Islam and the true teachings of, of Islam and the, the Holy Quran. Islam Ahmadiyyat permits no exploitation deeds, social, political, economic, or religious. It believes in absolute morality and enjoins justice and fairness with friends and foes alike in every sphere of human interest. Nineteenth century, through divine revelation, the Hadrat Mirza Hulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, the promised Messiah and Imam Mahdi proclaimed, "The time is near when I shall attain a magnificent victory, because in support of what I state, there is another voice that speaks, and in support of my hand, there is another hand that operates. Yet the world cannot perceive that which I behold. There is a heavenly spirit." which speaks in me, 
and grants a new word to every word and every letter of mine. Commotion has erupted in the heaven, which has caused this earthly body to stand up at God's behest. Every such person who has not been denied forgiveness and salvation shall soon see for himself that I do not make these claims on my own. Can they be seeing eyes which fail to recognize the man of truth? Can he be deemed alive who has no awareness of this heavenly core? He has started a community at the instruction of God Almighty. And he also made it very clear that some job towards the ultimate victory of Islam will be accomplished and the foundation will be laid in his lifetime with his blessed hand. And if I can refer to one of his prophecies, he did mention that I came to sow a seed and that seed has now been sown. Now it is going to flourish, it is going to progress and there is none who will be able to retard its progress. Yeah. first came to know about Ahmadiyya, it was the time when I was really searching for it. I did not know that Ahmadiyya existed in this world. It took me uh, two years to accept. I had to investigate first to see if these claims were true. And the man who was uh, inviting me to Islam, I decided to investigate his claims, you know, independently of what he told me. So what he told me was true, but he practiced what he preached. This book was appealing to me. accepted the Ahmadi Jamaat, I think is like most Christian converts, most, I say not say although most, is when I first read about the possibility that Jesus did not die on the cross. I remember when I read the book, Team of Jesus, that was the book that I read. And because I had, I mean, studied theology, I looked at the, the scriptures, and everything was accurate. All the references given in that book was accurate. And then suddenly, after reading that book, it hit me that, is, is it possible that Jesus didn't die on that cross? I saw that the Muslims were not following Islam, were not understanding the teachings of the Holy Quran and, and the true Islam which was in the Holy Quran, I could not see it in, in any of the Muslims around me. And uh, this was why I was searching for true Islam. I was, I was sure that true Islam was in the world, somewhere in the world, and I was trying to find it. And this was the time when I heard about Ahmadiyya, when I first heard about Ahmadiyya. The message of Ahmadiyya is a global message. I think it is a message which is badly needed for all people, whether Muslims or non-Muslims. Muhammadur Rasulullah